Hello, everyone. Welcome back into the story. Grab your Bible, a highlighter, a pen or pencil or notebook or anything that you might want to use as we move through today's story. Today, we are looking at the story of Jesus being betrayed. We're reading a number of verses out of the 18th chapter of the book of John. So if you want to turn to John 18 and get things ready, we will begin. This story brings us in touch with a couple of characters from the story. Jesus, of course, plays a large part in the story today. We also are going to meet Roman soldiers and we're going to come in contact with the chief priests of the Jews. And then, of course, we read today about those who betrayed Jesus, Judas, one of the 12, and Peter, one of the 12. The story takes place in a garden. It's a garden at the base of the Mount of Olives, which is across from the Kidron Valley. This is happening in between the town of Bethany and Jerusalem. John doesn't identify the garden with a name, but the other gospel writers call it the Garden of Gethsemane. Gardens, gardens are special places in scripture. You might remember way back at the beginning of the Bible, the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve had their first home, and then another garden that is prominent in the Gospel of John is a garden mentioned towards the end of the Gospel in chapter 20, where Mary sees the risen Christ. Many times in the events of the life of Jesus, they have extra meaning because of ancient prophecies or teachings, particularly from the Old Testament, that point towards this happening. In Hebrew scriptures, the idea of a coming savior was very prominent. Those people gathering with Jesus and the early readers of John's gospel probably would have been acquainted with prophecies in the Old Testament that talked about a Messiah would come. They would have remembered the promise that God would send them a savior. And in a number of places in the Old Testament, the savior is described as being the one who would deliver them as being victorious. But also at the same time, the coming savior is described as being humble and as suffering. Sometimes when something happens in the life of Jesus, those around him might remember a time that that, that happened before, perhaps with someone else. King David once wrote about in one of the Psalms how a friend had betrayed him. And when people saw what happened with the betrayers in today's story, they may have remembered how, Jesus, how David's friend betrayed him as well. David writes in Psalm 41, even my bosom friend in whom I trusted, who ate of my bread, has lifted the heel against me. And even Jesus in the New Testament, even Jesus said before it ever happened that someone would betray him. In the 13th chapter of John, verse 21 reads, after saying this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and declared, very truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. So the idea of a savior coming who was betrayed and especially who was betrayed by friends, that would have brought Old Testament prophecy to mind to many of John's readers. So at this point in the story, what, what has already happened? Well, Mary anointed the feet of Jesus and Jesus has entered into Jerusalem riding humbly on the donkey. Jesus shared the Passover meal with his disciples, and at the end of that meal, he washed their feet. And so the story continues. We pick up John 18, verse 1. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley 
to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. After Jesus had spoken these words, that's referring to the words of a very long prayer that Jesus prayed just before this action. It was a prayer for his disciples, his disciples then, and it even mentioned specifically for all of the followers, those who came long after Jesus died and was resurrected. Continuing with verse 2, Now Jesus, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. Judas betrays Jesus. The Gospel of John doesn't tell us how Judas and the chief priest made their deal, but from the Gospel of Matthew, we learn that after Mary anointed the feet of Jesus, then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Now you might wonder why, why 30 pieces of silver? How did, they, how did they come up with that amount of money? In Mosaic law, the law of Moses, there was a law that said, if your ox attacked someone's slave and, and hurt them, then you would have to pay for the damage done to that slave and the amount you would have to pay because your ox attacked that slave was 30 pieces of silver. Back in Exodus 21, we read that law in verse 32. If the ox gores a male or female slave, the owner shall pay to the slave owner 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. Continuing in verse three. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priest and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. You can almost see this happening in your imagination with the lanterns, the torches, and the weapons. John is careful to point out that the people who came looking for Jesus to arrest him, they were both Roman soldiers and they were the Jewish temple police, reminding us that it wasn't just the Romans by themselves who put Jesus to death, and it wasn't just the Jews, it was the Romans and the Jews. And they come with lanterns and torches. John points out and makes an issue of this happening at night in this garden, obviously when it's dark. John regularly uses the idea of darkness to represent evil. Continuing to verse four. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. As this takes place, Jesus is in charge. Jesus takes the initiative going up to them and speaking first, asking who they are looking for. Now, when they answer Jesus of Nazareth, he replies, I am he. Well, of course, what he is saying is, I I'm the one that you are looking for. But in reality, he is he is saying so much more. If I had translated this literally from the Greek, I really should have read it like this. Jesus asks, whom are you looking for? And then they reply, Jesus of Nazareth. And then Jesus says, I am. Just I am. Ego a me in Greek. It's it's the verb to be, you know, I am, you are, he is. And in most of our texts, it is translated, I am he. But people back then may have heard it as Jesus saying, I am. When John's earliest readers got to this point in the story, 
I'm telling you, they would have been shocked to hear Jesus identify himself by saying, I am. Remember way back when, way back in the Old Testament, when, when Moses encountered that burning bush? Remember how he asked God for God's name? And God's answer was, I am. God tells Moses to tell the people that I am has sent me. It's a bit hard to understand God giving himself the name I am, but that's what God says to them. So even though at the time this was happening, the soldiers and the chief priests and Judas and the disciples, maybe, maybe they didn't really realize it right then. But John's readers, the very first people who heard his gospel, and, and you and I today, John is letting us know that Jesus is God. Maybe you remember other times in John's gospel where Jesus says, I am something. Maybe you remember Jesus saying, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. There are a number of these I am sayings in the book of John, and John has put them there to let us know that Jesus is God. And so here in the garden, as they come to arrest him, Jesus identifies himself with God. Continuing on in verse five, again, Judas who betrayed him was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. In this verse, we see the soldiers and the police reacting to Jesus, not as if Jesus were an ordinary man, but as if Jesus were a God. There's a legend, now this is not in the Bible, but, but a legend that says every time Moses mentioned the name of God, that Pharaoh would, would fall to the ground. And, and in the book of Daniel, Daniel is standing before the king and King Nebuchadnezzar falls down before Daniel in respect to Daniel's God. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, we read in the second chapter of Daniel, worships Daniel and commanded that a grain offering and an incense be offered to him. The king said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you have been able to reveal this mystery. And Nebuchadnezzar falls down, worshiping in respect to God. So that's what the soldiers and the chief priests do. Continuing in verse seven, again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Several times in the book of John, Jesus says that God's plan is for Jesus to lose none of his followers except for Judas. In chapter 6, verse 39, we read, This is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. And also in John chapter 10, Jesus says about his followers, no one can snatch them out of my hand. We continue in verse 10. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. What a personal touch in this story John mentioning the name of the slave, Malchus. Can you just imagine that later on, if, if someone reading or hearing this story, maybe they were alive at the time this happened and they heard this name, what would it have been like if, if they knew this Malchus, if it was a, a relative or a cousin? Peter drawing his sword, Peter still thinks that that Jesus might win by force. Peter, Peter is a devoted follower of Jesus and, 
and he's grown into being the leader of the 12. But, but from time to time, he's still trying to make things work out the way that he wants things to. Or maybe we do that as well. Continuing in verse 11, Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? Now, of course, here Jesus is mentioning the cup. It's a metaphor for the idea of whatever it is that God gives or brings to us. The cup that God brings could be a blessing or the cup that God gives to us could be something that causes us to suffer. All throughout the story, John tells us how Jesus is completely in charge of everything that happens, how Jesus does not pray to God to remove the cup. Instead, Jesus is ready to drink the cup that the Father has given him. There's no hesitation and no doubt. It's a little different when Luke tells the story. For Luke, in chapter 22, verse 42, for Luke remembers Jesus praying that, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. John presents Jesus completely in charge, completely managing everything that is happening. Well, now we turn to the other disciple who betrayed Jesus, of course, Peter. Now, the verses that tell us this part of the story, they're all woven together. The verses that describe how Peter betrayed Jesus, they're, they're interspersed with the verses that tell about Jesus's interrogation by the high priest. And it's a fascinating story because the action in this story moves from outside in the courtyard with Peter and some others around a fire. It moves from the courtyard to inside to a wholly different group of people where Jesus and the high priest are talking. And it goes back and forth from inside to outside. And inside, we have Jesus speaking the truth to the high priest. And outside, we have Peter. Well, we'll see what Peter is doing. And for today, we are just, we're just reading the parts about Peter. So we'll get to the interrogation in the high priest next time. So we start outside in the courtyard. Verse 15, Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. Wonder who this other disciple is. We aren't given his name here as the story is being told. And actually, we don't find out for sure who this unnamed other disciple is. Often in the book of John, there's a reference to another disciple and other disciple. Sometimes there's a reference to the disciple that Jesus loved. People often talk about this disciple as the beloved disciple. Maybe you remember that at the Last Supper, it's the disciple whom Jesus loved, not given a name, who asks who will betray Jesus. And also at the foot of the cross, Jesus asks the beloved disciple to care for Jesus's mother. John 13, 23 reads, one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So while reclining next to Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? And then again at the cross in John 19, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. 
Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple, whose name we don't have, took her to his own home. Continuing in verse 17, the woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. That's one time. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming his self. We skip over a few verses as the action moves inside and then back out to the courtyard in verse 25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. That's twice. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. And of course, that's three times now that, G that Peter denied Jesus. Back at the Last Supper, Peter had once vowed that, that he would die for Jesus. And Peter war Jesus warned Peter about what Peter would actually do. In John 13, 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And so now, standing before the charcoal fire, Peter has denied Jesus three times, swearing that he did not even know Jesus. As he hears the sound of that rooster, he must have remembered what Jesus had said. We don't hear anything else from or about Peter until Mary Magdalene runs to tell Peter and our unnamed friend, the other disciple, that the tomb where they put Jesus' body was empty. We'll hear more about that charcoal fire in later chapters of John. Both Judas and Peter betray Jesus. And we wonder about the motivations of each one. We remember that almost any time Judas is mentioned, he's described as, as being dishonest and greedy. And you get the idea that he's thinking only of himself. Maybe, maybe the 30 pieces of silver, maybe that's enough for him to betray Jesus. John doesn't give us any more information about Judas, but from the other gospel writers, we get kind of a mixed picture. The story is not really clear, but it seems that, that Judas is so full of remorse when he realizes what he has done that he takes his own life. We don't get any more of his story. What was going on though in Peter's heart and mind? He had become a leader of the 12. It wasn't just the 12 themselves, well, the 11. It wasn't just the other disciples that, that looked to Jesus as their leader. It was Jesus himself who chose Peter to be the leader. And Peter, Peter was a close friend of Jesus. But that being said, throughout the Gospels, Peter is often shown to, to be impulsive, to, to act before thinking, to do the wrong thing a lot of the times, and, and to completely misunderstand what Jesus is saying and doing. Now, we do know that something happened Something happened later in the story. Something happened that changes everything for Peter. Well, we aren't gonna talk about it right now, but it changed everything 
for the whole world. And we know that this disciple Peter, despite, despite all of his mistakes, his misunderstanding, his bumbling around, despite his betrayal, something happens and God uses him in a very, very, very powerful way. It gives me comfort and it gives me hope and maybe it will for you as well to know that even when we betray Jesus ourselves, even when we fall short of what Jesus calls us to do, even when we are sinful, God doesn't throw us out. God continues to forgive us and to use us in extremely powerful ways. But, but we are not there yet. It's, it's time for us to look at the trial of Jesus, the interrogation before the high priest, and, and we'll do that in the next lesson, in next week's story. It's not time yet to know what happens for Peter after the death of Jesus, but stay with the story and remember, remember the charcoal fire. Thanks for joining us today.